Okay, everyone, this is Carl Blythe, the director of CORAL, and I want to welcome everybody today to our OER Hangout. We've been having these kind of informal chats with people who develop OER, who use OER. Uh, it's very informal. We will give uh, three presenters today an opportunity to share with you a little bit about their work, and especially today, the topic is on finding open uh, authentic, authentic text. So they're going to be sharing with you their tips that they have learned from their own uh, practice with OER. And um, let me just tell you a little bit about the ground rules. Um, the, uh, the presenters will talk for about seven minutes each. We want to keep that fairly brief so that we can have most of the time devoted for Q&A uh, because essentially we, we found that it's, it's better for people to ask their questions directly to the presenters. We have, there are three of us here at Coral, Sarah and Natalie and I will be looking, monitoring those, um, those questions as they come in. Okay, so let's get right to it. I'm going to introduce really briefly our speakers and then turn it over to, I guess, Chantel will go first. So um, Chantel is um, from the University of Arizona. She's uh, a, a, an applied linguist who has interests in literary texts and using literary texts in language teaching. She's also a colleague of mine in uh, the Language Resource Centers. Uh, there are 16 of us, and so Coral is here at Texas, but she's the co-director of CIRCLE at the University of Arizona. Um, and next we will have Gabriela Zapata from Texas A&M, not too far from our campus here at UT. And Gabriela is uh, also an applied linguist with special interests in multiliteracies and the development of OER, and also for uh, heritage Spanish. She has developed different materials for different populations. And of course, that's an important point of OER because they're adaptable. You can adapt materials to suit the needs of your students. Uh, and she's working on a project actually with Coral called Trajectos, which she will be talking about. Chantel will also be talking about a joint project, I think, between the two of our, uh, between Circle at Arizona and Coral. And that project's called the Foreign, Language, uh, Foreign Languages and the Literary in the Everyday. And our third speaker, Christian Hilchi. Uh, Dr. Hilchi is uh, a professor here at UT Austin, and he is the director of the uh, Czech program his background is in Slavic linguistics, and he is finishing up a project uh, called Reality Check. Um, and he has all kinds of tips to share on how to find the good stuff. Because the question really now is, you can find authentic texts, but we want to look at texts that are both open and then meet the needs of our students. And so um, I think uh, all, all three of our presenters have a lot to tell you about, about that. So Chantel, I see that you've got, um, are you ready? Ready to go? So let, let me turn it over to Chantel. She'll talk uh, for a while about her text uh, and then Gabriela and then Christian. And finally, I should also mention this one thing before I forget, Coral has an OER course that goes into much more depth. Uh, if you have questions about finding text, we have an entire course devoted uh, to that topic. Okay, so Chantel, you're up first. All right, thank you. Thank you all for being here and thank you for the invitation. Um, when I started sitting down and thinking about this question of how do you find texts in general, how do you find authentic texts, how do you find OER texts, a lot of the examples that first came to my mind um, were the result of serendipity. They were things I stumbled across, just happenstance. Um, and as much as I have a lot of love stories that I could tell about those texts and how I found them and how we've taught them, um, the more I thought about it, the more I thought it, it is a little bit like trying to explain to somebody how to fall in love because the right confluence of events needs to come. And so what I want to focus on instead of those serendipity texts is how do you go about finding texts when you have a real need, when there's something in your curriculum that's kind of pushing you in a particular direction, and then you have to go out there and try to, in the big wide world of language, find something that's going to work. Uh, and so the example that I'm going to highlight, uh, or a couple of examples that are clustered together are, as Carl mentioned, from the Foreign Languages and the Literary and the Everyday Project. Um, and I think we'll have the link for you in the chat in a second. Um, I'm mostly going to be working off of a PowerPoint because those texts are in German originally. And so I've translated them so that you can all access them. Um, but I'm just going to quickly show you the website so you have a sense of kind of where I'm working from. 
I think you can all see that. Give me a nod if someone can see it. Yeah. Okay. So this is the flight project, the foreign languages and the literary and the everyday project. Um, and it's much, much bigger than what I'm going to talk about. Um, but the example that I'm going to talk about um, comes from one of the German texts and from a lesson that we developed there for a German language curriculum, in particular, a first semester course. And in this course, we take uh, we work with a textbook, so we're bringing in these texts to augment the textbook, and uh, we take a kind of loose genre approach to how we think about bringing in authentic texts. So we're trying to find things that will very uh, directly augment and supplement the kinds of communicative and literacy-oriented goals that we have in the curriculum. Um, so, as I said, this example comes from a first semester German course, um, and I wanted to talk about this one because I think it's a, a sort of thematic unit that's probably familiar to many of you in different kinds of first year courses. So this is the chapter where students learn to introduce themselves, to describe themselves, to talk about themselves and others. Uh, and one of the frustrations that we had about this um, particular part of the curriculum and some others is that the communicative textbook um, tended to treat this as a very sort of neutral kind of activity, as if uh, there's one way that we describe ourselves, there's one set of attributes. We wanted to bring in something that reflect more about how we introduce ourselves in different kinds of contexts in different sorts of ways, and uh, to also bring in some playfulness. And so um, one of the graduate student instructors at the time, Chelsea Timlin, who I think is actually here on the chat, um, was the first one to bring the idea forward, singles ads do, all of the things that we wanted them to do in terms of the communicative and literacy goals. Um, somebody has to talk about themselves, introduce themselves, describe an ideal partner, um, describing others, uh, and do all of those things in a very short text and in a way that will feel very compelling, uh, attractive, et cetera, to others. Um, and so it became a really good genre for us to cluster this set of needs around. Uh, I'm gonna switch now away from the website and towards some of the examples. So the process to this um, was slightly bizarre. So once we had identified that singles ads were the direction we were gonna go, what we did was spend a lot of time on singles websites, German language singles websites, which is a very interesting way to spend your summer vacation. Um, not a bad way to do it at all. Um, and one of the things that once we had kind of moved in that, that direction of the genre that we noticed is that there are a lot of um, very typical sorts of attributes of singles ads, which make them attractive for this. Um, you tend to have a lot of um, cliche or kind of um, chunking sorts of statements that students can start to recognize. Um, things like, I'm longing for you, I'm longing for someone. So particular turns of phrase that were new to students, but that they could get their heads around. Um, but you also had a lot of the things that we were looking for based on the textbook we were working with. So things like people stating their age, describing something of their appearance, describing interests, hobbies, what kind of person they are. Um, for example, humorous, honest, uh, secure, loyal, etc., and describing these attributes, but having to do so again in a way that they would signal to somebody else that they were a desirable other partner. But there were other kinds of ads too um, and patterns that emerged, and this is why it became something that was important for the foreign languages and the literary and the everyday project, where we try to bring in this playful and creative language from a very early stage, um, because there were also lots of ads, these singles ads that had a lot of metaphor, a lot of language play, a lot of poetics and a lot of intertextuality. So uh, one of the motifs that comes across a lot of ads is the fairy tale motif. Um, so here we have someone who's not indeed looking for a dragon slayer, um, but is perhaps sometimes a dragon. Um, and so playing off of this envisioned story world where, where the person's gonna find that romantic loving man who can love the dragon and her. Um, or taking another example, um, this individual who positions himself as the warrior of light who's seeking the spiritual elf and creates an entire story world in which he's the warrior of the light, looking for an attractive Arwen, a Lord of the Rings reference, some great intertextuality, um, and then describes the hobbies that he had. So there was quite a lot of higher level literary play in these very everyday sorts of texts that we could play with, work with, um, and exploit. Um, so that kind of hits on a couple of the points that I wanted to make about how do we think about what kinds of texts, how do we maybe identify sorts of 
texts out there that we, so we can narrow our search? And then what kinds of motivations might we have, for example, wanting to bring in these critical perspectives in the play? Uh, the final point, though, that I want to make is about the question of what do we mean by authentic text? Um, because one of the things that we realized as we started uh, culling through these singles ads is that we didn't want to take them directly into the classroom in part because these were texts that we didn't have they aren't open text in the truest sense they we didn't have permissions for them they aren't published as pedagogical materials um, and there are all kinds of uh, privacy concerns that we had um, and so what we ended up doing is viewing these as uh, not completely open resources, but certainly resources that are out there to be adaptable and remixing them some. So the texts that I've shared with you and the ones we brought into the classroom are adapted, um, but I would still claim that they're authentic texts because what we what we kept was the meaning structures. We kept the basic um, sorts of texts that they were setting up and changed some of the bits of detail so that they would be hard to trace back. Um, and we kept the meaningful context. So these were texts that in their essence originated in a very real world meaningful sort of context. Um, but it does sort of get at the question of what exactly do we mean by authentic um, when we're talking about authentic text, which might be something that we wanna to continue to discuss. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Chantel. That was really interesting. And um, she, she raises many questions then about uh, finding the text obviously depends on the goals of your program. So they were looking at um, that may, maybe emphasizing the notion, as she mentioned, of language play, looking for playful language use in various texts. Um, she raises also a really interesting question about what constitutes an authentic text. We've been talking about authenticity for a long time in foreign language learning and teaching. Um, so uh, OER are fundamentally about adaptation. So an adapted text may still be considered authentic. That's an, I think an interesting point. Since so much of what we are just talking about really is about remixing uh, meaning design. So, okay, I think you've, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, so our next speaker I, uh, is Gabriela Zapata. Gabby, I hope you're ready. And Gabby's gonna be talking about Trajectos, her project and uh, many of the uh, things that she's learned over the years working on OER. So Gabi, the floor is yours. All right, uh, hello everyone. Thank you um, for inviting me to be here. I'm very happy to be here. And um, what I want to share mostly is, um, when I started thinking about what I wanted to share is, and thinking of you know our uh, experience working with trajectos and finding materials, open materials, um, I thought about, you know, one of the things that the first things, one of the first things that we learned um, with our team and then is uh, where to look for open materials. So what I usually, I usually start with um, the Creative Commons search engine, uh, which is, but I always use uh, the old search because they have a new one and I really don't like it. So what I usually do is I type the key term or the phrase here in the search um, um, slot. And then I start always with Google. So, you know, when you start with Google, uh, you can find all kinds of, you know, um, images. Uh, um, you can find also um, uh, articles and uh, newspapers and things like that. So I start there. But one of the things that I discovered is that this kind of search is not very good for videos because sometimes, you know, when you, when you uh, get to a video, it's not particularly open. So whenever I try to find videos, uh, what I do is uh, I, instead of you know, going through Google, the web uh, search, I go to YouTube. And, um, and so uh, in this case, I'm going to show you a video, how I found, uh, I think is one of the most wonderful resources that I found for Trajectos so far. It's a video on mate. Mate is the uh, national drink of Argentina and uh, it's part of our culture. I am from Argentina and it's part of, you know, it says a lot about um, not just, I mean, our cultural background and also how we view, um, you know, friendship, um, you know, relationships. So I wanted to focus on that particular uh, drink in the chapter that we have, in the section that we have on Argentina in Trajectos. So I look for mate, I, I, you know, I entered first mate and then I found all kinds of things that had to do with mate, you know, 
So, and then I try another thing. I said El Mate, and then I found videos that I didn't like very much. And so I then I said, well, maybe there's something that is more um, interesting. So I, I wrote animated. Okay, so this is what I did. And I found the first thing that appeared there was uh, this animated short. And I said, hmm, okay, let's try it. And um, so let me show you this video. And I hope you love it as much as I do. ¿Por qué será que el mate es un ritual solo de estos pagos? Y mira qué mate para elegir, ¿eh? ¿Será que la hierba es un poco amarga? Aunque cada uno lo toma como venga, según sus tradiciones familiares. ¿Será que nadie entiende cómo usar la bombilla? Pero hay una cosa en la que todos estamos de acuerdo. Y es que el mate es un gran compañero. Ahora te digo, lo más lindo es poder compartirlo. So I love this video and I hope that you like it too. And uh, why is it that I chose it? Um, so I chose it first of all because it's only, it's short, okay? So uh, it's authentic. Um, being from Argentina helped because I, it's, you know, first of all, the, um, the Spanish is authentic. And um, also it's, um, the, the language is simple and it's complemented by the images. And it, it is creative, it's quite unique. And there's a lot that we can analyze. Uh, there's uh, images that allow for analysis. Also, it is very interesting because it was developed by different artists from different South American countries. So you have artists from Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Venezuela. And it also complemented the material in the section that we have of Trajectos. So let me show you now um, what I mean. Okay, let's see. So this is our textbook, okay? And um, so uh, this is the, um, the chapter that we have on Argentina. So we have different aspects of Argentina. You know, we start with, we always um, make the comparison between Argentina and the United States. We talk a little bit about how similar the, the two countries are. We talk, to, we talk about um, the diversity that we have in Argentina in terms of languages, for example. The geography is very similar to geography in the United States. Um, we also talk about um, as, um, aspects that are unique to Argentina. We talk about, we bring it, um, we, in this chapter we focus on, on clothes, clothing and buying clothes and uh, activities. So we bring that there. And then we talk about, um, we talk about um, sports, you know, so things that are not usually talked about in uh, commercial textbooks. And then we go to Almate. And so we talk about the traditional drink. We talk a little bit about what, how similar it is to tea uh, and then how important it is. And then after we talk about all this, we bring the video, okay? Which is another, another way of looking at, at this drink. And then in particular, we liked it because it talks about, um, it shows the social aspect of Marte. And that's what we want to emphasize because we tie it to uh, social aspects in um, Argentinian culture. So this is the way we used it. We didn't exploit it as much as we could have because of the level, the performance level that the students have in this particular volume. But there are other ways in which you can use uh, a video like this. And let me show you, let me go back to my uh, presentation now. And um, 
one of the things that you can do, for example, is to, um, I mean, this, I mean, you could analyze, you could have a multimodal analysis of, the, of music or a discourse images and how these are connected to cultural aspects, the viewer, who the viewers are, the objective of the video, what is it that the video is trying to convey. Then you can talk about the organization of the video and why different types of visual and auditory media are incorporated in it. You can um, create a connection to the cultural values that are presented in the video and you can ask students to compare those values to their own culture. And then you could also talk about why um, you have in this video different artists, who these artists might be and why they have decided to collaborate and to create this kind of video. So I think that it's a very rich um, resource and that's why I wanted to share it with you. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you so much, Gabi. That was really great. Great examples. Um, I noticed from the, the chat already people are, are excited that they've learned something new. So CC search, that's a great tip for those of you who don't know how to search the uh, internet for open content. There's a lot of great content out there, but we're really interested in finding open text that we can use and uh, incorporate into our own OER. So that's a great tip for everybody. Um, I also want to make sure that everybody realizes that everything that's being shown here is part of, part of an OER, which means it's open for you to use. Trajectos, as Gabi was saying, is now under, de under development, but she was showing you what's already online. Um, I think we have in the chat the URL for you to access that. And the same goes for what Chantel was showing. That's the flight, F-L-L-I-T-E dot O-R-G. That's available to anybody. Okay, so now it's Christian's turn, uh, and Christian's going to tell us a little bit about what he has learned uh, developing his Czech materials. He's developed a, a first-year program in Czech that is very intensive in his use of, of open media. Great. All right, so I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about Reality Check. Um, so Reality Check, actually, uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, the name came up, uh, or I came up with the name because of the reality style interview videos that I created. There's about 240 of them on 12 different topics, and um, they are divided into various uh, proficiency levels. And um, this was a great title as far as I was concerned. It was, you know, it really kind of captured what was about the book, but the, 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 the title itself actually started to have a lot, or, you know, sort of take on more meetings. And, and one of the, the things that was really important for me was to reflect reality. Um, and so it was to go out and try to find as many authentic texts as I could. Um, and it started out with me doing a lot of different searches and, and not necessarily being able to find a lot of great materials. And then there was this epiphany moment where I started finding so much that I couldn't actually, I couldn't actually use all the materials that I was finding. Um, and I'm going to go in uh, a little bit about how um, I go about finding um, materials. And I'm going to actually be focusing on videos today. And I'm going to be looking at um, so if you uh, if you go onto the Reality Check site and you go into units right now, the first five units um, are are posted, and then the uh, the next five units are are going to be uh, hopefully ready shortly. Um, I'm going to be taking you into Unit Three. So this is a, a text from uh, Beginning Check. At this point, the students have been studying Czech for about five or six weeks. Um, and I thought, you know, what would what would be more interesting than maybe a video on chocolate? And I happened to find a video on uh, chocolate that was one minute long. And so I'm going to go and play that for you right now. Jeho podstatou je, že jak čokoláda, tak drogy aktivují v našem mozku takzvaná centra odměny. Faktem ovšem zůstává, že čokoholikové přece jen nejsou ohrožení tolik jako ti, kteří jsou závislí na opravdu tvrdých drogách. Nižší než obvyklá denní dávka čokolády by u nich měla vyvolat v nejhorším špatnou náladu. Závislá na ní nejsem ale ráda, to jo. Ne, to bych byla tlustá, takže já mám ráda čokoládu, ale nemůžu být závislá. Já čokoládu vůbec nemusím, já mám radši párek. Je ovšem taky známá řada 
řada pozitivních účinků, které má čokoláda na naše zdraví. Obsahuje řadu vitamínů, působí jako prevence proti kardiovaskulárním nemocem a mozkovým příhodám. Má kladný účinek na paměť a zlepšuje náladu. Záleží ovšem, o jakém cukrářském výrobku je vlastně řeč. Já hořkou, hořkou v nějakou kvalitní hořkou, ale tak do těch 75%. Tak já mám ráda spíš mléčnou čokoládu. Čokoládu mám rád bílou. Tak já mám ráda asi nejvíce bílou a mléčnou také. Když hovoříme o opravdové čokoládě, máme... Read something that's at a much higher level, but that they should be able to get with a little bit of glossing. The main focus, though, that I wanted, and you saw that there were three women who who came and and were interviewed. Um, this question that I asked the students that they can totally understand at this point: um, Are you uh, addicted to chocolate? And and this actually asks about these three women. They are asked, you know, are you addicted? Uh, so I asked them, you know, who says that they're they're addicted to chocolate? And so the students get to first identify whether these women are, are feel that they're ad addicted and then they get to have their own discussion. And now in that kind of discussion, of course, they get to talk about some of the things that we've been practicing talking about in class. And this, this whole unit is, uh, is devoted to food. Um, and so we've been talking about food preferences. And so they get to talk about whether they like chocolate, whether they don't like chocolate, how often they eat chocolate. And these are all the sorts of skills that we've been really practicing at this point. And they come in a very natural, very real, a re very reality-based um, context. Now, they don't actually in this video just talk about um, about uh, about uh, addiction to chocolate, but then there are four um, uh, four or I think people who who talk about what type of chocolate they like. So one happens to like bitter or or rather um, what we say in English dark chocolate, um, milk chocolate or white chocolate, and so they get to state their preferences. Again, the exact same kinds of things uh, that we are working on. Um, over the two or so weeks that we're in this unit as a class. Um, and so they, again, get to state their own preference for these. And so what was really important to me about this, uh, this video, and I should, I should note that, um, you know, I look for videos, um, I'm not necessarily looking for something um, or a video with something in mind. I'm looking for something that is on the topic and that is manageable. This happened to be a one minute video, so it's short enough that we can that we can, we, can, we can tackle it in class. Um, but rather, I, I like to see the videos or the text that I find as guiding the class, guiding the curriculum, rather than the other way around. Um, and that was a really uh, in, important moment for me um, in terms of, you know, all of these can be potentially good texts. How well can I use them in my class? How well can I adapt them uh, to, to the needs of, of the students? And this one worked out really, really well. Now, if it turns out, though, um, I happen to find this video um, by chance, um, doing a little searching, and I'm going to go into uh, some of that searching uh, or some of those tips for searching. But what's really great is once you find one video from uh, somebody on YouTube that is under an open license, and um, here you can see that it is licensed Creative Commons um, uh, CC BY, is I click on that on that user, and it turns out this, that that on is, level, but... this user posts lots and lots of videos. And so there's a ton of content for me to be able to use. Um, okay. Um, now, actually the first thing that I did when I tried to, started to search, and, and I said you know, before, I was having this, this you know, really difficult moment. Supposedly there are these open texts out, out there, and supposedly there were even these fabled open videos, but I couldn't find them. Um, the biggest thing that, that happened for me was, was, was just doing this YouTube search and actually was looking through vlogs. Um, vlogs were really important. I'm going to just actually show you some vlogs in English. So I'm just going to look up vlog plus travel and I'm going to set my filter here. So I just clicked on filter 
and then I go to Creative Commons, and you find all sorts of travel vlogs where people are, you know, talking about their experiences going somewhere or whatever. And I can go and I can do something else. For example, vlog Christmas. Let's say we're talking about holidays and, and I can set the Creative Commons again and I get, get a lot of different videos that, that, that work for that. And so vlog is a really, really good search term to use and that's actually how I found a lot of the users. Not necessarily all the videos from my users were vlogs, but they were, um, but, but maybe those same users happen to create other content. Um, you don't have to just search, search vlogs though, you can just, you can just go Christmas. Um, and then go to that filter for, again, for Creative Commons. You have to set it, unfortunately, every time. And you get lots of different interesting content out there. Now, um, so we were looking at chocolate before. And so if we were to do that, and again, Creative Commons, we have some chocolate videos as well. I also like to search on Vimeo. Vimeo also allows, so here's a search for chocolate that I made earlier. And you can also put the license in. So here I can search for CC BY videos. It's a little bit more annoying on, on, uh, on, on Vimeo because you have to click through multiple licenses that might be compatible with your project. Um, and, and, and as I've mentioned before, this, you, know, you, you end up finding these users that post lots of com content. Um, so this is just you know, one user that I've been, uh, I've been looking a lot, uh, a lot through her videos and, and, and the current unit that I'm working on. Um, her videos happen to be really uh, relevant. Uh, she, she posts a lot both on LGBT issues as well as um, on things regarding stress, emotions, um, uh, happiness, uh, things like that. And so I just go through all of her content looking for things that are relevant. Um, the same thing happened when looking at travel. So I found this one uh, couple that travels around and they've been to all sorts of different places, um, London, Warsaw, um, Berlin, Rome, uh, Palermo. And so again, looking through their content, I have all of this, this, this at my fingertips and it's way more than I can handle. Um, and it just sort of started with some simple searches and then sort of jumping eagerly down the rabbit hole. Um, and, and, and I've really embraced this uh, so much so that I've even gotten together with them. Um, so here is a, here's a picture of me in Prague meeting with, with some of these bloggers. Um, and so they, they've actually been willing to help me and, 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 and uh, have even volunteered to create some content for me if I, if I ask for it. So there's a lot of opportunities. Um, that, that might be more you know, sort of an, of an extreme sort of distance uh, that, than most users are going to go. Um, but, but the point with all this is that there's a lot of content out there. Um, and I think it just takes us a, a little bit of imagination into, you know, how can I adapt this? This video that I initially showed you on, on chocolate, my students aren't going to understand it, nor do I expect them to. It's rapid fire speech. Some of the constructions are really complex. And this is, as I said, five, six weeks into their instruction. But we can get something out of this video. And the students really enjoy it. And hey, they got to talk about chocolate today. So hey, I'll, I'll end it right there with, uh, with talking about chocolate. So. OK, thank you so much, Christian. I mean, everybody loves chocolate, right? So. Um, well, you had you said a lot of different things there. I, I just want to say that um, working with Christian, I was there when he had his aha, his epiphany moment, like, oh my gosh, there is so much content. So the question is not, you know, how do I find it? But then what do I do with it? Um, and he showed you some of his tips, like, you know, discovering vlogs. So these are particular genres that are open by nature. These are people who are creating content for the world and they take you into their houses and they share all kinds of interesting details. I wanna start off, so now we're gonna to shift to our um, Q&A. And remember to type your questions into the chat box, but I'll start things uh, going here with, um, Christian, you use the word reality. And I was kind of smiling because reality is a contested term these days. Like, sure. and so, so I was gonna say, wh whose reality? Yeah. And, well, and I say that, one. yeah, I'm so, well, just let's start things, going to stir the pot a little bit, because typically in, com in commercially produced materials, they're g generic by nature, and what you end up doing is kind of canonical perpetuating, perpetuating canonical content or stereotypes. Uh, Karen Riesinger talks about convergent situations. So Czech people are only going to talk about goulash. <laughs> That's all they ever eat. And so I noticed from your content, 
Czech people have a much more interesting life than I ever imagined because they travel to Vietnam and they don't always eat uh, goulash. And so it, it, it comes back to representations of reality. Yeah, that's Yeah, cool, no, but... I didn't want to create a caricature of the mm -hmm. language. That was, that was super important for me because that was the impression that I kept getting from everything. Either I got this very sterilized version of, of Czech culture or this very caricatured version of Czech culture. And I didn't think either one was, again, uh, very much real in the terms of the, the, the Czech culture that I experienced. Um, you know, I, I, I guess coming from, uh, from graduate st studies in Czech, everybody that I talked to was interested in Czech literature and Czech film. And then when I mentioned some of these short stories or novels or famous films to Czech friends, some, a lot of times they just have no idea. That's just not something that they're interested in. But they might have gone to a film festival, or or they might that's something that they, or they might go to chocolate festivals, or they might do something else. Um, and so I, I I'm kind of aiming it more on the sort of the everyday interests of people. And so if I find it out there and it seems um, seems appropriate, then I put it into that box of reality. Um, this is it's it's clearly real at least for somebody. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's 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 enough for me can i add something to that the yes because i think in addition to the kind of stereotyping cultural homogenizing one of the things that happens with textbooks um and i saw this in what christian was sharing and it wasn't there in what i showed but it comes up in the singles ads is they also homogenize the potential identities of the students so one of the things that comes up often in the textbooks when you have things about um, looking for ideal partners or talking about these things is that they completely erase any LGBTQ identities from existence. So one of the things that was important to us in bringing in singles ads was also to represent the variance of that of, of those kinds of texts in a way that textbooks usually don't. That's a good point. So the one of, I mean, I've had this discussion also with Gabby recently um, about targeting different kinds of populations that are then relevant to our students. Yeah. So it works on both ways. You're trying to represent more diversity in your materials. And then of course that touches on the diversity of the students themselves. So that's a really good point. Um, I wanna also maybe ask all of the speakers, uh, this is a question that really was uh, started by, I think Chantel, she used the word serendipity. And it seems that all of you, there's an element of serendipity in finding something in this, all of finding the needle in the haystack or, or finding the perfect video. And, um, you know, your, your moments, up, while you're searching, one thing leads you to another thing that leads you to another thing. And could I just ask you maybe to share your anecdotes about um, an, a moment where you found something, but in this kind of crazy way, because uh, Christian was talking about using various search engines, very important tip. So how to filter the content. It's important that people know that you can use Google search engine, but you filter it or Vimeo or, or, YouTube, or YouTube. But um, can you guys just share something from your own personal experience and you found a really great piece uh, of open content and you came across it in a strange way? Or just uh, how did you find some, like, uh, let me make this more concrete. How, again, did you find those, those um, personal ads, uh, Chantel? Well, for, for those, I, I went out and searched for them because it was driven by, by Chelsea's idea that this might be a good genre. But one of the, when you talk about serendipity, one of the other examples that from the flight project that uh, comes to mind is a lesson that we have uh, around memes and, um, and how memes are used. And the idea for that came because there was this whole case where uh, at a German university, a door was broken on a university building, a very banal kind of experience. And they posted a sign about it being repaired. And then students sort of trolled it by posting, printing off memes and posting it around there. And it became this entire saga and has now, it continues to have an entire Facebook page devoted to this single door at a university building in Mainz, Germany. Um, and so sometimes it's also just random stuff that comes up and you realize, okay, there's something here. Cause once we started playing with the meme as a genre, um, it got into all these questions of intertextuality and how do we cite and what do we cite um, and became a really fun lesson for a more intermediate advanced level. 
Okay, what about the rest of you guys, Gabi or, or I, Christian? Um, well, for example, I mean, the, um, the activity that I created last week um, uh, about um, Greta, you know, Thunberg, I am, um, you know, I am an activist, so I'm always reading um, Democracy Now. I mean, that's what I, I listen to Democracy Now, and then I read, you know, their website. I mean, and that's how I found, um, I wasn't looking for anything uh, in terms of, you know, pedagogical terms. I was just reading, and then I found this video. Um, anything that from Democracy Now is uh, open, so you can use it in your materials. And, uh, but you know, I, I always listen to their English, you know, um, uh, broadcasts and also read their, their articles in English. But then I, I found um, this, uh, you know, interview uh, and it was an interview to, you know, um, they were interviewing an activist, a young activist, and, and she was speaking Spanish. And I was just like, oh my God, this is perfect for an activity <laughs> because I wanted to do something, um, I wanted to uh, do something that had to do with activism, you know. Uh, I think working with activism and, and in the Hispanic community in Texas, and then I am so interested in, you know, uh, this young woman, you know, Greta. I mean, I think that, you know, um, because, well, first of all, uh, she has autism like my son. So, you know, to me, it's very, very close in terms of, you know, what she is trying to achieve and also because of her autism. So I just found that video and I said, this is perfect. I cannot lose this. So I decided to uh, create an activity around it and I may use it for projectors. So mm -hmm. that's how, you know, sometimes I find also sometimes things uh, on Facebook, people post things and they are, I go to, you know, the particular site that they mention and it's open. And then I start thinking about something that I can do. So, yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, so Sarah is telling me that there are a couple yeah. of questions in the chat chat area. Oh, go ahead, yes. Sarah. Okay, um, so the first question was from Jim for Christian, although I think any of you could probably answer this. Uh, he was wondering, do you ever encounter the problem of building a whole activity around a video, and then in a later semester, the video has been deleted? Um, we've, had to, we've had that problem in French, and we've had to redo whole activities. Do you have any suggestions? I guess I can go ahead and start. Um, yes, I have had that problem. Um, and that's why uh, working with uh, open videos is, is really important because uh, those, those, those R's tell us that we can uh, retain uh, that video for ourselves. Um, I actually am gonna, um, uh, I, I foresaw this question uh, coming up. And so, you know, I have actually just a, you know, this, this, this thing, I actually use clip grab um, and grab them off of YouTube. Now there are uh, some problems with this. Um, you know, uh, if you shall not download any content, content um, uh, unless you, are, you see a download or similar link displayed by YouTube on the service for that content. So technically speaking, that is against the rules of YouTube. Um, What's interesting is, is that if you look at this, you know, by marking your original video with Creative Commons license, you're granting the entire YouTube community the right to reuse and edit that video. So YouTube kind of has two different stances on this, this issue and um, it, they, they don't really um, work together. And it, it used to be really easy. YouTube had this YouTube video editor and then they took it down uh, a couple of years ago. And so uh, you used to be able to just import content straight into that, but it is uh, it is no longer available. Um, so yeah, but I, I do download it. Um, I have actually been in contact with um, with vloggers before, as you saw um, just from my picture that I did meet with some. And so um, I actually did go that extra step, although the license doesn't tell us that we need to, they've already licensed it so that we can use it. Um, I did go the extra step of, of saying, hey, I, I really would like to use these videos in, in, in in, in my curriculum, how do you feel about that? And they were, they were ecstatic. Um, so uh, that's a can I? That's a very important point. That open content is created by somebody who wants it to be shared, and so they, it's probably a really great idea for you as a materials developer to contact the person, to be in touch with the person, because they then become a resource for you. So that's a great tip for people to think about. Don't be afraid to contact people uh, who have created the open content for you. Um, what about Vimeo, though? You, you just talked about YouTube. Is it easier to download open content from Vimeo? I use the same clip grab software. Um, uh, I mean, Vimeo has, um, it does allow some users to have a premium account, and so they can actually provide direct access. Uh, I, I've, I've rarely encountered 
a download link that that premium account would allow. Um, the last time I looked through the license of, of Vimeo or the terms, um, I didn't see anything explicitly prohibiting, but it's been over a year. So I, I mm -hmm. don't know for sure. Um, but yeah, the same software works uh, for, for getting videos off of there. And yeah, it's a pain when content, I just had that happen actually, open content that was taken down that I didn't have a copy of. Um, mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a big deal. I wasn't using it for anything, you know, more than a very short four minute activity. So, you know, nothing, nothing major lost. But. Yeah, I think that the problem is really with video because mo you can download texts and images, still images much more easily. But yeah, vi when a video disappears, that's a problem. Um, we had another question for Christian about how long that lesson took. Was it just for one day? And it might be interesting to hear from Gabriella and Chantelle about this too, just um, how long have you spent with those texts with your students? Mine, the chocolate one was maybe 15 minutes. 20 minutes. Um, it's 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 a portion of an in class um, activity, so or part of part of part of a day's. Okay, thanks. And how about you, Chantel? Uh, for ours, that's about a two day lesson, and it builds into a, a writing task. That's part of why the genre consideration was really important for us is that we want them using those as models for for what they're then writing. So we spend a couple of days is talking through the texts and then modeling the texts and then having them start to brainstorm script their own version of it for a, fi a fictional singles ad, not for their own personal singles ads. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And how about you, Gabriella? The Mate video, did you? Yeah, um... no, what I haven't used it because I mean, it's just, um, you know, I, it was part of, I have developed it for the oh, Okay. So, you know, but I, w the way I envision that whole lesson is for, for teachers to either um, pick and choose, you know, or uh, I think that you could, you could, that act you could do that activity in 10 minutes, 15 at the most. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. And then someone else asked for more tips about finding blogs, such as key search terms. Christian, do you have I any think the, the, the key search term really is vlog. Um, I, I know that sounds crazy, but um, I really, I mean, I've just put anything, travel, vlog, um, dessert, vlog, um, name your holiday, vlog. I mean, I truly have gone, um, but I don't just use vlogs. Um, I really like to be able for, for, for students to have a glimpse into the target culture from the very beginning, even when we're just learning vocabulary items in the first unit. So I, for example, use um, time-lapse videos. You can find a lot of uh, open time-lapse videos um, of your own city of, for example, in my case, I found them of Prague or Brno or Olomouc, various Czech towns. And so even though they don't know a lot, I mean, at this point, my students really don't even know a verb yet. They can just name things on the screen, but they can go and name things um, that they see. So a time-lapse of, of a random, so let's say, of Prague, and they're naming buses and people, and and they're saying that's water, and that's a river, and those are trees, and and things like that. Um, that's another genre that really works uh, works well, um, and it doesn't just work at the, uh, the 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 novice level. I mean, you can you can create activities off of a time lapse that go all the way into the superior level. Um, you know, how do you feel about the ubiquity of cameras in today's society, right? That's a different question, but, you know, people are making these time-lapse videos where all these people are captured in them. So that's a, that's sort of a natural prompt that you can go into. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, of, of, of room to work with these kinds of, uh, these kinds of texts. So, okay. The idea is then you use the genre as the, the search word. So a vlog or a time-lapse video. Yeah. Um, so could we just, could you tell us a couple more of those kinds of genres? Because I know in your work, you've got other kinds of videos. And I learned from you that, for example, the unboxing genre. Yeah, let me actually, um, so. Because these are all like gold mines. Once you hit a gold mine, you think, oh my gosh, there's so much open content. Yeah, 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 there you go. So, um, and these are actually international words. So um, even languages that don't use uh, the Latin script, so for example, Russian, which uses Cyrillic, they still will write vlog um, uh, or time-lapse uh, in English um, next to it. So these are, these are internationalized words. Uh, so vlog is the one that we've talked about so far. I just mentioned time-lapse. Hall, um, I have 
found lots of haul videos. These are videos where somebody maybe buys 30 dresses and they go and try on one dress after another and give their opinion on it. Um, or they might buy, you know, 10 ties or something like that and try every tie on. Um, unboxing, uh, this one I haven't actually used uh, in, in my curriculum so far, but um, somebody buys a new iPhone and then they show their process of, of, um, of opening it up and talking about it, their first impressions. Um, room tour is a great one, another international word. So you can get people to give a room tour or an apartment tour, et cetera. And so then you get a lot of very simple and this is my this and this is my that. Here's my, here's where I hang my coat, um, et cetera. So those are, those are the, the, the five main genres that I've discovered and have done a lot of searching and, and had a lot of success uh, in terms of uh, finding really good content. So you, you raise a, another important question and that is, do you search always in English or do you search in the target language? And, and I mean, wh when do you decide, how do you decide or does it make any difference at all? Um, I'm, I, I guess that really is for all of us, um, but I, I'll start, I search in the target language, but with these international words a lot of times, at least as a start. And that oftentimes is how I find the users who are creating the content that are creating other content. So I search through their, 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 their playlists or their, their, their repository of videos and, 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 and then find the gold mine. Speak. Okay, what about Chantel and, and Gabby? Do, do you search in English or in German or in Spanish or, or both languages? I would search in German and and I think kind of this goes back to the serendipity just real quick because a lot of the curriculum building I do is in collaboration with graduate students and I'm always a little bit nervous sometimes to send them out searching too far because I'm very worried of their time. But I think something that's come up in all the talks is also if you search a little bit, you find things you can subscribe to and then you stop and then you don't search as much. In some ways, the content comes to you because they're in your Facebook feed or you're subscribed to their channel. And so some of it is also about figuring out ways to search less by identifying the right spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a few other questions from people. I don't know if we'll have time for all of them, but um, a couple of people asked about flipping. So do any of you ever have the students watch these videos at home and then talk about them in class and how does that work? As in flipping I, the classroom. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm, I can speak to that just briefly because we're teaching a lot of hybrid courses now. And so some of the things like the kind of things that um, Christian shared, blogs and videos, we use those a lot in the hybrid portion of the course. Um, but the kind of text I shared, I would not use in a flipped course in part because I think once you start trying to really foster more kind of a critical awareness that tends to work better in the classroom in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead, please. In my, um, what we do is like, usually we start with the previewing, pre-reading, you know, all of those activities in class. And then students watch videos at home and then we do the uh, comprehension, they do the comprehension. And so we, sometimes we check the comprehension, but we do, we do the interpreting in, in class. So it's kind of like, you know, revive, but yeah, we, they usually don't, unless you, we want to show them something in particular, we want them to analyze a particular, uh, you know, multimodal section. So uh, then we, we show that, but that's it. Right. And I should just say for our participants that Gabriela and Chantel are developing materials that are inspired by kind of a multi-literacies framework. So there's a lot, a heavy emphasis on critical framing and interpretation. And I, I agree with both of you. I think that kind of activity is best done with input from the teacher. Um, and so in a classroom, right. Any other questions, Sarah? Um, yeah, there was one, well, there was an interesting comment from Amanda who said, my students are doing a lot of work with using corpus tools to collect and analyze authentic texts. They collect them by topic or genre. So that's another suggestion. Um, and then Tina had a question. Do you ever train students on how to find open materials as they go out to develop personal projects for presentations, for example? And if so, how much time do you dedicate to that and how does it go? Yes, definitely. I mean, everything that my students are doing in, in class that is multimodal, um, they need to use open resources. So what I, um, what I usually do is I spend Part of when I give instructions, I spend part of the um, time in class. In class, I mean, just showing them how to find materials and then how to cite them. 
And so uh, we talk about attribution and what the different licenses mean. I also have a, you know, I create a document that I post online and they can resort to. So, yes. So folks, I see that we are coming up on the hour and I want to thank our presenters, um, Chantel, Gabi, and Christian. You guys have so much interesting, so many diff different tips. And I guess that you've picked up over the years of developing OER. Um, and we typically end uh, here by telling you, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, our uh, course. So please visit our OER course. We have a lot more information, including information that you heard about today of how to use the CC search engine, how to search for particular genres and so forth. Um, we want to encourage people to join our learn community. These are, these are open educators using OER or making OER and you can get badges for your different kinds of levels of participation. And finally, um, since these, um, we need to tell the federal government, those who are funding all of this, what we're doing and, how, uh, and, and what you think about it, we have a very, very brief survey that we'd like you to answer. So if you click on the URL, which will be given to you in the chat, chat room, um, you can take that survey, it only is a couple of minutes and all that information goes back to the federal government. So uh, thank you guys again. Thanks everybody for joining. We had a really good participation over 30, I think about 35 participants today. Thank you all.